Hello and welcome to the FIDO Certification Program webinar. My name is Tasha Silva and I'm the Event Specialist with the FIDO Alliance. Before we begin today's webinar, I'd like to point out a few items. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our site by the end of this week. All attendees are and will remain in listen-only mode. We ask that if you have any questions to place them on the question pane, which is located within the control panel. Once the webinar has concluded, we'll make every effort to answer as many questions as possible. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce the panelists conducting today's webinar. We have Brett McDowell, Executive Director at the FIDO Alliance, David Rivera, Senior Software Architect with Lenovo, and Adam Powers, FIDO Certification Secretariat. Brett, you may now begin. Thank you, Tasha, and thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, it's quite obvious from the registration numbers at today's webinar that uh, we are doing something of interest here with the FIDO certification program, um, and hopefully we will uh, be able to get through the overview material uh, expediently, um, but not too quickly, so that you actually learn what, everything you need to know about this program. But I know I speak for all of the presenters today when I say that we're looking forward to the Q&A at the end of the call. So please get your uh, questions ready or put those in the pane and we'll get to them as soon as we can. I'm gonna start us off today with a brief overview uh, of FIDO, FIDO Alliance, FIDO Standards, and an update <clears throat> on how well we're doing uh, to these days. And then we're going to spend, excuse me, the bulk of the webinar on the certification program today. So why FIDO Alliance? Essentially to address the internet security demands that have not been fully met with today's credentialing technology resulting in data breaches and statistics like this. Now nearly 800 data breaches reported uh, last year, uh, over a billion personal records stolen since 2012. Um, that's from a Wall Street Journal report uh, and on average uh, about three and a half million dollars and even up, upwards of that from a Poneman Institute study uh, per data breach. So this is a huge multi-billion dollar problem, multi-billion credential problem, and it all stems from uh, weak or stolen credentials. Essentially, the world has a password problem and the FIDO Alliance was formed to address it. We're addressing it by developing new technical standards that can be used for authentication, um, either to move your security dependency on passwords off of passwords and onto FIDO U2F second factor authenticators, or in some use cases, replacing the password entirely with the first factor through FIDO UAF. And I'm about to tell you more about that. Our new model is Fast Identity Online, or FIDO, and it is essentially online authentication using public key cryptography. That's the takeaway. I know that you'll often find that you're reading about FIDO in the context of a story specifically around biometrics uh, because that's kind of the hot topic these days, but I want to emphasize FIDO is not a biometrics technology. FIDO is not uh, only used in the context with biometric authentication. It is a general purpose authentication framework uh, and set of standards that support both first factor authentication and second factor authentication. And our fundamental technology is the interoperable online authentication using public key cryptography. So let me tell you a little bit more about exactly what this is and how it works. The old model of uh, was, is often referred to as a shared symmetric secret or a password. It's essentially a bearer token that the user knows, human readable secret that the user knows and the server knows. And so the server has to invite the user, challenge the user to type that secret in and then, <clears throat> and then that makes it, excuse me, vulnerable to all of the man-in-the-middle attacks that are out there, to phishing, to social engineering. It's just an inherently vulnerable architecture. What FIDO does is we introduce this notion of an authenticator. So now the user 
authenticates themselves to their device or by either using user verification through techniques like pin codes or biometrics or by simply giving presence and possession of the authenticator. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then the authenticator does the work of authenticating you online, again, using FIDO standardized uh, public key cryptography. FIDO supports two major use cases. We talk about the passwordless experience and the second factor experience. It's very easily illustrated in three steps here on this diagram. In the passwordless experience, uh, which is the canonical use case for UAF, or Universal Authentication Framework, the online service sends a challenge to your device. The FIDO client on the device challenges the user using uh, biometric verification quite often, but there are other methods supported, such as PIN and patterns. And then the FIDO client signs that challenge with the private key that the user that was registered when the user registered their device, and that signed challenge goes back to the server, and that's how you're authenticated. The online server doesn't have the private key, never has the private key, validates that it's the correct authenticator because they validate the signature, because when the device was registered, they received the public key off of that unique key pair for that service and that account. The other use case that we support is second factor authentication using FIDO U2F, or Universal Second Factor Specifications. Here, the flow is after you've delivered your first factor, typically username and password or uh, PIN, then your challenge for your second factor. Again, the server sends the challenge for the second factor, often in a web application environment. Then the user is prompted to give presence to their FIDO U2F authenticator, What's in the market today are uh, USB devices. You give presence in a number of different ways. There's innovation happening there. Sometimes you touch it, sometimes you might pull it out and put it back in, but you give presence to the USB-enabled FIDO U2F authenticator. That gives the authenticator the permission from the user to sign the challenge with the correct private key, and that signed challenge goes back to the server. Same fundamental idea between UAF and U2F, and you're authenticated online because the online service was able to use their public key to validate the signature. So to reinforce the point again, FIDO authentication delivers online authentication through public key cryptography. We enable plug and play and innovation on the client side where you can see a lot of different biometric authentication techniques and other techniques and form factors entering the market all the time and innovating and bringing new experiences all the time because FIDO is an abstraction layer to make that interoperable. So you can introduce new experiences for that user to device interface, but the device to the online service interface is what we standardize. In summary, there's no third party in the protocol. This is a point to point protocol. There are no secrets on the server. The secrets are the private keys and the private keys are protected by your FIDO authenticator local to the user. Biometric data, if it's used, never leaves the device. This maintains privacy, a lot of user concern around the data breach of biometric material. So again, if biometrics are used, which they're not required, that biometric data never leaves the device. What the server gets is a signed challenge. There's no linkability between services or accounts. So not only is there a unique key pair per online service, there's actually a unique key pair or key pairing between the authenticator, the personal device, and every account, even if you have multiple accounts on one service. In other words, the FIDO standards don't introduce an identifier in the protocol at all that could be used for correlation or tracking of users. So a very privacy by design architecture. The benefits of FIDO are pretty simply summarized as better security for online services, reduced cost for enterprise through the power of open standards, and it's simpler and safer for consumers. So not only is this about better security, 
This is first and foremost about better user experiences. No more typing, no more hunting for another code to type on top of what you already typed. It's touch, look, press, very simple user gestures resulting in very strong cryptographic authentication. Now a little bit about who is the FIDO Alliance. We are a nonprofit trade association, uh, been growing quite a bit since we launched in early 2013. We're now over 200 global members. And I want to emphasize these companies. These are the companies that sit on our board of directors uh, representing uh, relying parties or service providers, uh, people who have the use cases of needing better authentication, uh, stakeholders who are focused on improving user experience. So folks like Bank of America, Discover, MasterCard, PayPal, Visa, Alibaba. Uh, we also have device manufacturers, uh, OEMs, as well as network providers, with NCT Docomo being our most recent uh, board member from mobile network operator, the first mobile network operator to join the FIDO Alliance Board of Directors and deploy FIDO. More on that in just a minute. And platform providers, whether that be browser platforms, operating systems, mobile and desktop, from companies like Google and Microsoft, Samsung and Lenovo. And then vendors who specialize uh, as enablers, I would say. Chip manufacturers like ARM, NXP, Qualcomm, uh, specialty devices, Oberthur, of course Intel, our newest board member, and biometrics companies like Synaptics, IdentityX, Crucial Tech, uh, Ubico, uh, really being a market leader in the uh, U2F space with security key manufacturing, and RSA, uh, a leader in bringing better security to the enterprise. So we have a very carefully developed board of directors to make sure that the problems we solve in the FIDO Alliance are real world problems and that we're prioritizing uh, getting something done as opposed to just getting together and talking about what might be done. And I think that has been the primary reason why we've been so effective over the last couple of years. Our mission is simply summarized in three parts. We develop technical specifications, FIDO UAF and FIDO uh, U2F. We operate programs designed to ensure adoption of those specifications. And today's webinar is going to focus on one of those programs, which is the new FIDO certification program. And it is our mission to pursue formal standardization of our technical specifications uh, when they reach the appropriate level of maturity. With that, I would like to turn and focus a little bit about adoption. In 2014, before our specifications were even finished, we saw very early adoption of uh, review draft specifications. PayPal was the first deployment using the leveraging what Samsung had done on the Galaxy S5 for mobile payment using fingerprint over FIDO. Alipay followed suit soon after. And then Google was the first deployer of FIDO U2F with their security key announcement last year, which introduced FIDO U2F security keys as a new second factor authentication in the uh, well-known Google two-step verification system for anyone with a Google account, Gmail account, or any Google service. In 2015, there have been a similar set of major announcements from significantly influential players in the ecosystem. Microsoft made the first announcement by publicly committing to support FIDO in Windows 10. Then Qualcomm announced that they were adding FIDO support into the Snapdragon module and their new biometric sensor. And that, if you don't understand the significance of Qualcomm, whereas Microsoft Windows 10 is quite obvious, uh, Qualcomm enables over 85 different OEMs today. So those are all different handset manufacturers around the world in various markets. And they're accredited to being responsible for over a billion uh, active Android devices in market today. So when they adopt FIDO, that is a significant uh, barrier of adoption that just went away uh, for the Android market specifically. Then Google uh, announced in 2015 that they were taking their security key deployment, which had been deployed for Gmail users and Google account, 
and bring it to the enterprise. So now there is a full service, you know, dashboard credential lifecycle management set of tools for enterprise uh, for all of the, I believe, over 5 million businesses that use Google for work. And then most recently, Entity Docomo made their announcement that they have rolled out uh, FIDO UAF 1.0 enabled services, four different handsets uh, in the Japan marketplace that are all FIDO certified. Um, and Adam will speak a little bit more to that soon, as well as uh, numerous services off of their core identity, uh, Docomo ID, which is now a FIDO-enabled service. All of these deployments are powered by product implementation, and those product implementations now can go to market with the branding support of being FIDO certified and those companies that want to deploy FIDO solutions now have the additional confidence that all of these FIDO certified implementations are going to interoperate and what we have promised as the use cases that FIDO supports, that promise will be delivered by these implementations. So to tell you more about the FIDO certified program, I would like to introduce David Rivera from Lenovo, who chairs the Certification Working Group and the FIDO Alliance. David? Thank you, Brett. So we are uh, very excited to have the FIDO certification program up and running. Um, we created the certification program with a few goals in mind. Uh, one is to, be, to enable implementations to be identified as officially FIDO certified. Now, they think this will serve uh, a couple different classes of implementers. If you're an implementer and you sell directly to end customers and consumers, uh, the FIDO mark, the FIDO certification mark, uh, helps the end consumer know that the product has been tested and certified to work in the FIDO ecosystem. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're an implementer who sells to uh, perhaps to OEMs, you have devices you produce or you produce a server that you sell to relying parties, uh, the FIDO, FIDO certification mark um, helps, helps again show that your product was tested and uh, is validated to, to work in the FIDO ecosystem. Um, the FIDO certification helps ensure interoperability between uh, FIDO officially recognized implementations. So basically what this means is uh, your, your product has been tested, um, it, it adheres to the specifications and it works well with um, other products that have been FIDO certified. And FIDO certification also helps promote the adoption of the FIDO ecosystem. So this basically helps prove to the market that FIDO is real. There are FIDO products out in the market um, available for purchase. They have the FIDO logo on them. Um, and we know through certification that they work well and work well with each other. So an overview of the certification process. Um, certification is available for both FIDO members and non-members. And there are four uh, key steps to getting FIDO certified. First is self-validation. So there's some FIDO provided test tools uh, that you can use to test your implementation to make sure that they are working correctly uh, as, as the spec defines. Then there's an interoperability test. Um, those are events organized by the FIDO Alliance where implementers can bring their implementations, have them um, tested against other implementations that are present at the event, and this helps ensure that, you know, in a real-world scenario, uh, the devices are talking correctly to servers. Um, there are no issues with the, with the uh, implementations. The next step is uh, formally applying for certification. This is essentially submitting some paperwork to the FIDO Alliance, indicating your interest in, in uh, being certified, showing that you've completed the first two steps successfully, and uh, getting you the FIDO certification. And the final step is certification mark usage. This is an optional step, but if you're interested in actually using the FIDO logo on your product, uh, you would submit a trademark license agreement uh, to FIDO, and that would grant you use of the FIDO certified uh, logos. Provide a little bit more detail on each of the steps uh, uh, in the next few slides. 
So how do you get ready for FIDO certification? Uh, so today the certification program supports UAF and U2F uh, version 1.0. Um, there are certified products in the market today. And you can see a list of those products if you visit the FIDO Alliance website. There's a, a matrix of all the products that have been through FIDO certification testing. Uh, server vendors are encouraged to uh, support both UAF and U2F protocols. This will help uh, provide support for the broadest range of uh, devices in the market. And if you're a UAF authenticator vendor, uh, a couple of things that are important to do. Uh, one is to get a vendor ID, and you also have to register the metadata for your authenticator. Uh, again, this is only for UAF authenticators. Um, again, we'll have a little bit more information uh, in the following slides. And um, I'll at this point turn it over to Adam Powers, uh, the FIDO Certification Secretariat, who can provide you a little bit more detail on the certification testing process. Thank you, David. So uh, as Tasha mentioned at the top of the hour, and as David just mentioned, my role within FIDO is uh, actually operating the certification program. So uh, behind the scenes, answering questions for implementers that are looking to certify uh, their, their devices and their services uh, as FIDO. Uh, so I will talk a little bit more in detail about the, the process that David just outlined uh, in terms of those four steps for certification, the uh, self-conformance testing, which is the slide that we're on right now, the interoperability testing, the registering for certification, and uh, how, how to apply for the rights to use the uh, FIDO certified trademark. So the first of those uh, four steps, the self-conformance testing, uh, is intended to uh, enable the implementers of the FIDO specifications to uh, have some degree of confidence that their implementations are uh, conformant with the, the specifications. Uh, so these are online tools uh, that will test uh, clients and servers and authenticators alike. Uh, there are two different tools. There's one for UAF and there's one for U2F. And there are two different uh, websites that, uh, that the different implementers go to to test their implementations. Uh, and these will do both positive and, and negative testing, so it'll go through things, uh, test cases like ensuring that uh, you can authenticate correctly or making sure that you won't authenticate correctly when you shouldn't authenticate correctly, and so on and so forth. And there's a, a large number of test cases that these test tools will run through to make sure that an implementation uh, is, is conformant with the specifications. Um, the, the process for doing the self-conformance step is first going to the FIDO certified website and there's a place to register for access to the test tools on the certified section of the website. Uh, and after you have access to the tools, you can review the online help for the respective UAF and U2F tools. Uh, and then you can run the test as many times as you would like. So you can include this as part of your development process. It's not a, a one-shot deal. Uh, you can test every day, every hour, every minute if you want to. Uh, and uh, as soon as you're confident that your implementation will pass the tests, uh, then you can uh, designate that the next test that you're about to run is an official test, and it will create an official log uh, on FIDO's servers as far as that test run goes that we can refer back to uh, as part of the official certification records. Um, after you, your implementation has passed that uh, official test, the, the next step for certification is to move on to the interoperability testing. Uh, it's important to note that the self-conformance uh, validation is a required step before moving on to interoperability testing. Um, a couple of tips for first-time participants in the FIDO certification program. Um, the U2F tool that's also called UTHS uh, requires some software to be developed to interface uh, to U2F implementations. So just plan your, your testing schedules accordingly. Know that there's going to be uh, a week, two weeks, three weeks of software development to hook up the UTHS, the U2F test tool, test harness to your implementation uh, in order to do the automated testing that it does. Um, the other note there is that the U2F test tool also requires uh, a Gmail account, and it's using uh, Gmail authentication to log into that system. Uh, 
It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, one account per user. Your software development team or organization can create a single Gmail account uh, and share it amongst yourselves so that everyone can log in or everyone can have their own Gmail account, whatever you see as uh, most fitting. Um, and then the last tip there is for UAF. Um, UAF requires that there, uh, as part of the testing, that you have a server, a client, an authenticator, the, the three different device classes for UAF. So you may have to find test partners to test with so that you can have all three of those uh, uh, components for testing. So for example, if you're a company that is only developing a UAF authenticator, uh, note that you would need to find a client and server partner to work with so that you have the three pieces that you need for doing UAF testing. Uh, so with that said, let me move from self-conformance to interoperability testing. Um, and interoperability testing, the overall goal is to make sure that implementations will work together in the real world. Uh, obviously, specifications can't cover every corner case. There may be different configuration options. There may be uh, different corner cases uh, where you want to make sure that the, all the different variables that are in a, a specification will work together when they uh, encounter each other in the real world. Um, so to that end, the, uh, the, the goal of the interoperability testing is to get all the UAF implementations or all the U2F implementations that are going through the certification program into the same room at the same time to go through the same basic transactions with each other to make sure that if they, if and when they encounter each other in the real world, uh, that they'll work together. And there's there's different interoperability events for UA, UAF and U2F, but they follow generally the same format. Um, and that format is that uh, there will be an event location. Uh, traditionally, these events have been held in Silicon Valley, but uh, we, we are looking to diversify in the future to accommodate the high degree of participation that we have in Europe and Asia. Um, and all those implementers will get together in the same room uh, to do this interoperability testing. And I'll talk a little bit more about what happened to those interop events on the next slide. Um, the logistics are that registration typically opens about four to six weeks ahead of time. And again, that registration is available on the certification section of the FIDO website. Um, and registration is open up until 14 days ahead of the event. Uh, right now we have two events that are coming up, one in the middle of July and one, so July 14th through 16th for UAF and July 28th for U2F. So for example, uh, the last day of May would be the last day to register for, I'm sorry, the last day of June would be the last day to register for the UAF uh, event that's coming up. So that would be coming up fairly quickly here. Um, and then uh, as part of that registration, before that registration closes, the implementation that's being registered uh, also needs to pass the self-conformance testing. And that's something that we'll verify as registration closes. We'll go through and, and ensure that everyone has passed self-conformance testing uh, just to make sure that the implementations that will be at the interoperability event are at least minimally uh, compliant with the, the specifications. Uh, just so issues that arise at the interoperability event aren't uh, coming out of uh, poorly implemented uh, devices or servers. Um, and then one final note on logistics is that obviously in-person attendance is preferred, uh, especially for communication and coordination uh, amongst the, the large number of people that have shown up to these events. Uh, for uh, companies that are remote, like in Europe or, or Asia, uh, remote attendance is acceptable. Uh, and uh, it'll most likely be in the middle of the night for those locations, but if it's too expensive or too much burden to, to fly to these interoperability of events, we understand. Um, so on the next slide, let me talk a little bit more about the interop criteria. So what happens at an interoperability event? Uh, the idea is to test every implementation against every other implementation at the event to make sure that if and when they encounter each, encounter each other in the real world, that they will work together make sure that there's no bugs or errors or unexpected circumstances that, that uh, pop up when they're interoperating with each other. Um, the, the tests that are performed at these interoperability tests are basically the real world events that users would uh, perform. So this is register, authenticate, perform transactions, deregister, 
all the, the user-facing types of activities that, that uh, FIDO supports and basically going through and performing this, the same set of actions with all the different combinations of uh, devices at the FIDO event. The intent is that in order to pass interoperability testing, you must pass uh, these, these simple tests with every other implementation at the interoperability event. Uh, and that's uh, just to make sure, again, if, if there were an error that came up at the event, you wouldn't want uh, end users in the real world to see that something that's FIDO certified doesn't work with something else that's FIDO certified. Uh, it, it would be uh, harmful to FIDO, it would be harmful to the devices, it would be harmful to the brand, it would be harmful uh, in a lot of different ways. So that's what we're trying to prevent. Uh, should issues arise, uh, it's possible to always adjust and retest, whether that's uh, reconfiguring, rebooting, uh, even rewriting code. But uh, if there's something that requires those sorts of readjustments, the requirement is to go back and, and test all the, the same tests again just to make sure that uh, any, any changes don't introduce new bugs or new problems. Um, and so at this point, uh, assuming that an implementation has passed the interoperability testing, it would go on to uh, certification registration. Uh, a couple of tips for first-time implementers going through the uh, interoperability testing. Uh, between that 14-day that period when uh, registration closes and the interoperability event starts, there's an option uh, during registration to opt into pre-testing, uh, and that enables uh, FIDO to connect all the, the parties that are interested in doing pre-testing with each other ahead of the event to basically do all their interoperability testing in the 14 days leading up to the event. Uh, that is absolutely critical and that's one of the keys to success in, in terms of passing these interoperability tests is to get all the, the bugs and all the errors worked out ahead of time to, to any degree possible uh, just so that when you show up to the event, it's more of a formality of demonstrating that these implementations work together and not a debugging hackathon uh, event. Uh, so, so hopefully all the implementers that are going through these interop events will take advantage of that uh, option for, for pre-testing. Um, so on the next slide, uh, after you've performed both the conformance self-validation testing and, the, and passed the interoperability event, uh, you're ready to, to apply for certification. Um, and basically this just requires submitting that uh, you've passed both of those, those key steps in the certification program and that you're interested in submitting for certification. Uh, it, certification will be granted as soon as possible. Uh, typically doesn't take uh, more than a few business days, but uh, plan on 10 business days just to be conservative. And all FIDO certifications are public unless confidentiality is requested, and that's an option during the certification process. Uh, the other step for certification, which we'll talk more about in just one step, is uh, the fees. So you'll also have to submit the fees for certification. Um, also know that the, notice that there's a derivative certification program. So this is for uh, FIDO implementers that are going to have a high volume of devices. Uh, so cell phone manufacturers, for example, that would have lots of different SKUs uh, that are all based on the same FIDO code. Uh, the idea is that a derivative is basically the same FIDO code or the same FIDO implementation uh, across multiple devices. Uh, and it's, it's designed to be lower cost and effort in terms of FIDO certification. So uh, the idea is if the FIDO implementation is the same and it hasn't changed, uh, just say that this, this new device that's being rolled out is the same as this other one, register it with FIDO so that we know that uh, it's, it's valid and it's certified and it's based off another certification. Uh, and so uh, then you can claim being FIDO certified because we know that it's already been through the interoperability testing, been through the self-conformance testing and is a, a good known good FIDO implementation. Uh, derivatives don't have to go through the interoperability testing. They don't have to go through the self-conformance testing. There is a step of, of just asserting that uh, you've test, minimally tested it and you know that it works. Um, and the, the fees, which I believe are the next slide, are much lower for derivatives than they are for first-time certifications. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, the certification fees um, for not 
on members that are going through the program, there's an upfront annual fee of $3,000 per year, and that's just to offset the cost of developing test tools and managing the program and all, all the overhead of the, the program. Uh, members don't have to pay that uh, non-member resource access fee. It's included in their uh, FIDO dues. Uh, for certification, members pay $5,000. Non-members pay $6,500, and that's per certification. So if a, a company is uh, certifying a server and an authenticator, that counts as two different certifications. Or if they're certifying a UAF uh, server and a U2F server, that counts as two different certifications and has the fee associated with it twice. Um, and then for derivatives, members $500, non-members are $70 or $750, and similar to certification, that's per derivative. Uh, other fees, uh, there's a vendor ID fee, which is a one-time fee, uh, and that's, again, just for UAF authenticators. It doesn't apply to anything U2F, and it does not apply to UAF servers. It does not apply to UAF clients. It's just UAF authenticators. And then as far as uh, interoperability testing and access to test tools go, uh, those are both free for uh, anyone that's participating in the program. Um, so then the final step of the, the four steps that we laid out at the beginning of this is uh, registering for certification mark usage. Uh, so this is largely targeted at uh, authenticators and clients. Uh, for as far as uh, executing a trademark licensing agreement goes. It's a contract that basically says you're allowed to use the FIDO certified logo with your FIDO certified products. Um, you have to follow the, the guidelines of not squishing the logo or changing the colors of it or applying it to things that aren't certified. Uh, and otherwise, uh, feel free to use it broadly. We encourage you to use it for as broadly as possible. Uh, for relying parties, so the, the websites that are uh, rolling out FIDO certified services, there is a clickless license on the FIDO website uh, that is based on the, the Node.js and OpenID licenses for, that, that they use for their uh, uh, logo usage. So the idea is that you don't have to have every website, uh, millions and millions of websites come and execute an agreement with FIDO to use the FIDO uh, certified logo. You just say if you're going to, uh, if you have a FIDO certified server and uh, you agreed to use a logo in conjunction with that certified server, then go ahead and use it. Uh, so the idea is to, again, enable millions and millions of websites to roll out the FIDO certified uh, logo so that they can actually identify to their users that FIDO is uh, part of their service that they're offering. So after you've made it through those four steps in the program, uh, on the next slide we talk about uh, what to do uh, with your FIDO logos and your FIDO certification. Uh, you can put the FIDO logos on your website in, in conjunction with your products and say that you're FIDO certified. Uh, FIDO has been doing quite a bit of working with members in terms of their press releases that they're putting out about being FIDO certified. We, we enjoy the fact that members are so excited about and all implementers are so excited about their uh, uh, certifications that they're writing press releases and we, we strongly support that. Um, you can put your FIDO logo in your software applications, you can put it on your product briefs. We strongly encourage people to put FIDO on trade show booths. So there's a lot of options for how to get a lot of value out of that FIDO certification uh, after, after uh, you've completed the entire program. Um, and in the next section of this deck, uh, David will talk a little bit about the people that have been through this program. Uh, and have uh, been rolling out their, their FIDO certified services. So, David, back to you. Right, thanks, Adam. <clears throat> thanks, Adam. Um, so, as you can see uh, from this chart, there have been uh, many companies that have gone through the certification process. Um, their logos are shown here, and again, you can find information about them on the FIDO website. I'll quickly run through some of the numbers on uh, products that we've seen come through certification. Um, last year, the uh, FIDO Alliance had a FIDO Ready program, which is a way to sort of seed the market for products that were uh, working on, um, on earlier versions of the FIDO specifications. FIDO Ready was a mark that uh, those products would use to indicate uh, that, that they're working with FIDO, that you know there are real products out there uh, uh, that adhere to FIDO logos, uh, FIDO specs. 
Um, the FIDO certified program, we're, we're happy to see a lot more companies involved and a lot more products um, out there. So uh, 11 FIDO ready products uh, last year, uh, or, sorry, 11 FIDO ready companies last year, uh, 20 this year. Um, those those companies that put out implementations, we have uh, twice as many FIDO certified U2F products. We went from five FIDO ready ones to ten FIDO certified ones, and uh, from went from ten FIDO ready UAF products to uh, 23 FIDO certified UAF products. In U2F, uh, we see vendors um, certifying. Uh, devices, so the authenticators and uh, servers. In UAF, we see uh, some of the software, so the FIDO clients, the devices, the authenticators, and the servers. Um, so we can see pretty good, um, pretty good participation in the certification program uh, across the board there. So call to action: What to do if you want to get FIDO certified? Um, of course, you want to start with the FIDO specifications. So uh, there's the link on the FIDO website for actually getting the specifications and developing your products to those specs. Uh, you want to register for uh, test tool access, so that will allow you to test your implementation against the specifications. Uh, you want to be ready to prepare or to participate in the interops. Um, the next interop for UAF is scheduled for July 14th through 16th, uh, and U2F on July 29th. Both of those will take place uh, somewhere in the Silicon Valley area. And if you're interested in participating in those interop events, uh, you can register at the FIDO Alliance website. If you have any questions um, about the process, about what you need to do, um, please contact us at info at FIDOalliance.org. And just to uh, go over some of the more common questions that we see, um, do you have to have a, a vendor ID? You do have to have one if you are a UAF authenticator submitting for certification. Um, U2F and UAF servers do not require vendor ID. Again, this is only for UAF authenticator devices. If you need any of the forms, um, again, the FIDO Alliance website, fidoalliance.org slash certification. It will be your entry point to um, all, all information about the certification program, including some of the information we've covered here today, uh, forms, fees, etc., all listed on that website. Um, what's it cost? As, as Adam went through this, but just to repeat some of it, the test tools uh, you can access for free. It's a way to, uh, for you to validate your implementation. If you're a non-member, you do have an annual $3,000 fee to, to have access to those. Uh, the interop event is also free. Again, it's another way for you to validate your implementation. Uh, once you're actually ready for certification, if you're a member, it'll cost you $5,000. A non-member will be uh, $6,500. Uh, for derivative certification, again, you've, you're, you're basing your product off of a previously certified product. That one is $500 for member companies and $750 for non-member companies. And if you actually want to use the FIDO logo, once you've completed certification, uh, you submit the uh, TMLA, the Trademark License Agreement, and there's no charge for that. And how do you get started? Again, the FIDO Alliance website. Um, you can get access to the test tool there, fidoalliance.org slash test tool access request. Submit a request to get access to the test tools. Um, that'll get you going on actually uh, using the test tools for um, testing out your product. And I believe that's it. So uh, we're going to open up for questions. Great. Thanks, David. So now we'll open up for questions. <clears throat> First question, I didn't completely get the UAF authenticators concept. If I develop biometric authentication system, am I a UAF authenticator? Can you repeat the conditions for UAF? authenticators to get certified? Well, um, I think that's uh, going back to kind of my introduction on the authenticator. So why don't I start and then, you know, David or, or Adam can finish it off. If you are a biometrics uh, authentication vendor and you're, you're interested in FIDO and FIDO certif certification, the first thing to know, and I guess I never spoke specifically to this, 
well, I didn't use these words, but I did emphasize biometric data not leaving the device. Um, let me use the other words that are common in the biometric space, remote match and local match. So the FIDO use cases are explicitly uh, limited to local match use cases and one-to-one -one biometric authentication. So that would be the first thing. Um, if you are in the remote match, uh, one-to-many or even one-to-one -one, uh, bi biometric business today, uh, we've seen a lot of the companies that have gone through uh, building, testing, and certifying uh, biometric uh, FIDO UAF authenticators. They, they were explicitly, exclusively in the remote match business, and then they added kind of this, this FIDO opportunity to their product suite. So they still are using the same user verification technology, but they've re-architected it to fit into the FIDO use cases. So that's the first thing to think about. So, all right, I'm going to do ex explicitly and exclusively local match. I'm going to do an implementation that's local match only. Um, so then what you need to do is build uh, what to what's called the ASM. Uh, again, today wasn't a technical tutorial. I would recommend that you do go back and look at uh, previous webinars and look for the uh, UAF technical webinar, or you know, Tasha can probably um, put a link to that in the chat box for you before we're done today. Um, because that'll explain what the ASM is as a uh, separate from the FIDO client, the FIDO UAF client. But as an authenticator vendor, you're going to implement ASM. And then you're going to want to work with uh, FIDO UAF client and FIDO UAF servers. And at this point, I will turn that over to Adam to talk about uh, what our test tools can do for you uh, in terms of getting you from ground zero to uh, getting ready for certification. So again, Adam, the scenario here is I'm someone that's been building user verification biometric technology for a while. I want to build a FIDO UAF authenticator um, starting from scratch. Uh, how do the FIDO test tools help me or do, should I be doing something before I'm even thinking about using those FIDO test tools? Yeah, I would I would say that there's two aspects to that. The, the first is that uh, the conformance self-validation test tools, uh, wh which are the test tools that you can register for on the FIDO website, uh, enable you to take the, the messages coming out of the authenticator, so out of the, the ASM that Brett had mentioned, and validate that the messages going across to the server uh, are actually valid and that you've hooked it up correctly. And we've seen um, companies that are, are like what Brett has been saying, that are new to FIDO but uh, very well established in biometrics, the, the part that's not familiar to them are those messages that are going back and forth uh, between the authenticator and the server and, and how to get hooked up there. So those test tools are really important and a good, good place to get started in terms of hooking up existing authenticators to uh, the FIDO servers and ensuring that you're doing it in the correct manner. The, the other thing that I would encourage uh, new implementers to do and new new authenticator implementers to do is go find partners to work with. There are a number of companies listed on the FIDO website as far as the uh, FIDO certified servers, the FIDO certified clients that are out there. Uh, it's very good to establish partners there early and as much as possible just so that you have a stable of companies that you can work with uh, to coordinate in terms of uh, interfaces and protocols and make sure that uh, your new implementation is going to work with some of the older and more established uh, implementations. So the, the, one of the, the key goals of any standards organization is to, to encourage companies to collaborate to the betterment of the market. And so basically what I'm saying here is, is feel free to collaborate not only in terms of, of participation in standard, or the FIDO standards and or certification program, but also use those companies that have identified themselves as being FIDO implementers and feel free to proactively reach out to them and collaborate with them on your own new FIDO implementations. Um, and that'll happen naturally anyway as, as you go through the certification program and, and go to the interop events, but uh, er, early and often is, is kind of my motto for, for those sorts of interactions. Uh, Brett, was there anything else you thought I should cover there? Yeah, just uh, I'm realizing we're not saying the most obvious thing, which is um, you'll want to download and read through the technical specifications. So you go to our website, specifications, just download them, and you're going to want to look for UAF and specifically the ASM authenticator commands. That's what you're going to have to implement. 
and then um, you can tie yourself, you can either continue to build out your own stack and build your own FIDO UAF client, or what most uh, authenticator vendors seem to be doing is partnering with someone who has already built out a FIDO UAF client. And you can see who they are by just going to the certification page, as Adam said. But I think that's, I think we've uh, kind of said all we can say about that. Um, it's a great question. Uh, Tasha, are there others? Yes. Can the same U2F device OEMs submit certification twice? For example, the company A is a FIDO device manufacturer and they have done the FIDO certification. And company B will sell the FIDO device from company A. But due to business needs, company B wants to have that device be certified under their company name. Does, is this considered a derivative certification? Brad, I can take that one. Yep, I was expecting you to. <laughs> okay. uh, so, so yes, that's the the prime use case for derivative certification is if if uh, Bob's cell phone or Bob's authenticator company certifies as FIDO certified, and then uh, Alice's uh, cell phone company picks up that authenticator, uh, Alice's cell phone company would would file a derivative certification saying that Alice's new cell phone is using Bob's uh, authenticator and only pay $500 for that uh, derivative or $750 as the case may be uh, and uh, uh, be able to, to start using that authenticator right away without having to go through the, uh, the, the FIDO certification program beyond just registering that, that implementation. Uh, so that's that. The way that the question was phrased is exactly one of the use cases for derivatives. Yeah, Adam. The only thing I would add is, um, you know, to illustrate this a bit, the one part that might be non-intuitive is that we sort of recognize whoever went first as the core, and then every every other certification as the derivative. So it's more about the chronological order as opposed to any other construct. Um, so, for example. I'll pick on David because he's here. Uh, so if Lenovo uh, partnered with an authenticator manufacturer and the only market opportunity to that authenticator manufacturer was to be an authenticator that's in a Lenovo device um, and Lenovo was happy to have that be Lenovo branded. Maybe they even called it the Lenovo FIDO authenticator or something. So the actual manufacturer of the authenticator is not involved in the certification uh, in that situation. Um, but then maybe that manufacturer of that component does uh, see more market opportunity later. They would come back to the FIDO certification program and say, look, this is the same stack. I have all the rights to reuse it. I'm going to reuse it and I'm now going to put different branding on it. Even so what the fact that you wrote the initial implementation doesn't really matter because it was Lenovo who got it certified in the first place. So you come, you come back and you say, now I want to market it in other, uh, in, through other channels and I want to put other branding around that implementation, then it would be a derivative. Even if you think, well, because I built it, aren't, aren't I the core and isn't the Lenovo the derivative, we work off of a chronological order. Whoever first certified it is the core and then every other certification of that same implementation is a derivative. I just give Adam a chance to tell me I'm wrong, but otherwise I think that's how it works. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, so Tasha, yeah. next question. Oh, Actually, go ahead, before David. we move on, yeah, I just want to make the quick point: derivative certification does assume use of a product without you know major modifications to it. So if you are taking um, you know some authenticator device and integrating it or relabeling it, but in the process you know maybe changing the crypto engine or changing the way you store your keys and that. You know, that's not a derivative, that's a modification to the process, which would, to the product, which would assume, you know, a recertification. Yeah, very good point, David. Great. If a company does not apply for a certification, is there still a way for FIDO to recognize that it has passed the certification test? Uh, there is no, there's no program for that at this time. And I think we're, we're trying to encourage the certification process soup to nuts. We don't mandate that, obviously. We make testing uh, both test tool and test events free of charge, uh, especially for, uh, I guess there is an access fee one time per year, access fee if you're not a member. 
but we anyway you're not required even if you pass the test you're not required to do certification or sign a trademark agreement but we we want to encourage that we think that's best uh, best case and best practice for the ecosystem so that's the only uh, workflow that we're currently supporting great thanks our hardware our hardware security tokens using U2F over USB HIS protocol are now abbreviated as UAF authenticators. Read that again more slowly. I think I might get my acronyms confused there, or someone did. No problem. So our hardware security tokens using U2F over USB HIS protocols now abbreviated as UAF authenticators. No, those those are U2F authenticators still. Yeah, that's those are U2F security. So Google uh, kind of established an you know their own branding we call them security keys, but what FIDO refers to them as is uh, FIDO U2F authenticators. So maybe that's what the the person meant. Uh, yeah, and but they wrote UAF. But yeah. Next yeah, so, so one, one note on all the, the implementation classes for certification. So there, on the UAF protocol side, there are UAF servers, UAF clients, and UAF uh, authenticators. And you can certify as any one of those. And on the U2F side, there are U2F servers and U2F authenticators. Um, and I'm not sure the question about USB, the, the HID, the uh, HIS, uh, the that uh, they're asking about, uh, that would be a, a U2F authenticator, and that would be one of the, the things that can be certified there. Great. Are there other standards that are similar that banks are adopting, or is FIDO the first of its kind? As far as I know, FIDO is the only uh, standards body working on this very specific tightly scoped problem uh, of interoperable authentication between device and online services. Uh, obviously the world is filled with standards, uh, standards in the security space, standards related to identity management, identity federation, um, security tokens, uh, and uh, OTP devices like the uh, OATH uh, standard for OTP devices. So in general, no, we're not the first of our kind. Uh, very specifically around um, the authentication protocol, uh, I think we are the only organization and the only standard set in this space right now. Great. Regarding the interop testing event, UAF, for example, are we testing against other vendors seeking certification, or is this a controlled test, for example, against already certified UAF products or vendors? Adam, why do you take that? Currently, the, the testing is, I'm sorry? Uh, sorry so, was, so currently, the testing is against all, oh, sorry, Brett, did you want to take it? No, I was just saying, Adam, why don't you take that? <laughs> sorry. Uh, so yeah, cur currently, the, the testing is against all other vendors seeking uh, uh, certification. So, so it's all the new implementers going through and going through uh, interoperability testing at the same time. And keep in mind that the FIDO certification program uh, has only been live since the, the beginning of April. So there's not a lot of implementations. Well, I guess there's uh, a lot that have already been through, but there's not a, a stable of devices that are on the market that we've been using for interoperability testing. It's just now that that option's becoming available to us. Uh, there's currently some consideration for uh, expanding the program to include uh, reference devices that are known good and have been through the certification program as part of that interoperability testing, uh, but that's not currently something that's happening. So if you're going through the next interoperability test, uh, you will be testing exclusively against vendors um, that have, that are also going through the certification program for the first time, uh, just like uh, your own implementation. Uh, for anyone that's passed this July event, there may be reference devices from the market that are included as part of that interoperability testing as well. Yeah, I just want to say that, um, you know, to the speaking to you, kind of the, the benefit of membership in the FIDO Alliance itself, uh, which is not required for you to go through certification, I'll just say that again. 
but the whole certification program is the brainchild of the membership uh, of the certification working group. So they have the governing authority over uh, how we how we do what we do, what the rules and procedures and policies are. Um, Adam and I work on that with them, but the members ultimately decide what they want out of this program. Um, and then, of course, it's all ratified uh, by our board of directors. So if you have an interest um, in influencing this program, if you want to see things added to the program or modified by the program, uh, if you are not already, you become a sponsor member of the FIDO Alliance, then you would have full uh, membership in the certification working group. And you can start working with uh, David and Adam and everyone else on the evolution of the program. Great, so we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, we can ask one more quick question and then close out. How many other clients and servers max will an authenticator need to test with? Um, the, so as far as, as the maximum number, the maximum number is however many implementations show up to an interoperability test. Uh, the minimum number would be, I believe, uh, two others of each class. So, for example, if you're an UAF authenticator, you'd have to test with two clients and two servers and all the combinations thereof uh, to pass interoperability testing. And that's, that's based on the size of the number of participants of the event, not based on uh, uh, just only doing two. So the idea is, the idea is to, again, achieve as much interoperability uh, and, and as much confidence that these implementations are going to, going to work together in the market as possible. So if there's 10 implementations that show up at an interoperability test, the idea is to, to show that you will be interoperable with all of them uh, when all those implementations show up in the market. And I'll just end on this note. The, the program, uh, like Adam said, the first time we ran through certification testing was April and into May. Um, and this is our second round in July. So I will, I will leave you all with this, that the program is in evolution. And I think we are off to a very strong start in delivering real value, not only to the participants, but to their customers and the ultimately the end users who use these uh, FIDO-enabled services. But it continues to evolve, and it will evolve and adapt, uh, especially to scale, um, which I think that question gets to. <laughs>